in his feud with presidential advisor and son-in-law Jared Kushner. There's also word behind the scenes that the end is nigh. According uh, over the weekend, according to the New York Times, the report that Kushner allies told the president of the increasingly unring coverage that Kushner is receiving from Breitbart News, the website that Bannon used to run. And at the Mercer's own. And now anonymous sources tell Business Insider that Breitbart editors ordered staffers to stop writing stories critical of Kushner. A Breitbart editor responded that it's an absurd suggestion that they would muzzle critical, co critical coverage of any senior White House official. Jeremy. Jeremy Jeremy Peters is with us. Uh, He's Jer got a little bit more reporting on Jeremy, this. Jeremy, uh, why don't you give us our reporting? I'm wondering right now is that Bannon is an island unto himself and that the end is near. I think there's a, there's a bit of a detente, Joe. It, it, it sounds like, from from my reporting over the last 12 hours, the the situation has thawed somewhat. Now that doesn't mean that that this is going to be easy going, happy clappy going forward here. But I think Bannon has been telling people, look, you know, I'm I'm a bomb thrower, but I realize I I, I can't toss bombs every day, and I've got to pick my battles more carefully. There's a, a, obviously a recognition that he got on the wrong side of Jared and Ivanka, which is a huge mistake. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's... So, so Jeremy, have you heard from insiders, what I heard from, I heard from three different people... I don't understand. <clears throat> ...high up uh, in the administration yesterday was, they think that Bannon just, and I'll use the word that they're using inside the White House, quote, snapped. And everybody is very concerned that he would show such extraordinarily bad judgment, because... When you're talking about attacking Jared Kushner, that's code also for attacking Plus Ivanka your Trump. Not. Yeah. Mm. You're gone. And I think that's why you're going to see him lay low. I think that's why you're hearing him tell people behind the scenes, I've, I've, I've got to pick my battles, and I know that. So whether or not that repairs the damage that's been done, I, I don't know. But did he not know that you don't, you don't pick uh, battles <laughs> with the president's daughter and son-in-law? I think that should be pretty obvious to anybody it who should. works inside the Trump but White it, House, right? I mean, the family is first. Right? Absolutely. So here, here's here's what I, I, I think that, well, from my understanding of the situation, this didn't really rise the president's attention until he started reading all of the press clips about it. And once Trump saw that his internal disarray was becoming the story that was knocking all of the other achievements of last week, for example, the Gorsuch confirmation, the strike in Syria, that that had, had in many cases overwhelmed the narrative that they wanted to tell. That's when Trump said to them, look, you guys work it out. I don't have time to deal with this. Fix it. And and it looks like they're trying to fix it. And remember, no. his, and the, the Bannon agenda has not fared well here in these first three months. The travel ban, mm -hmm. the executive order was stopped in the courts. Yeah. Obamacare was not repealed. As a nationalist, as he calls himself, he was not for the strike in Syria. All of these achievements, or the lack of achievements that Donald Trump has had, have fallen against Steve Bannon. So it's not like he even has the weight to go into the president and say, Get behind me. Look what it's done for you no. so far. What they're, not, what they're seeing inside the White House are two things. One is that Bannon is attacking, attacking the Trump family through Breitbart, Roger Stone, and other sources. And they find that to be extraordinarily reckless. That's someone. Number two, Donald Trump is hearing Steve Bannon running around talking about his agenda. His agenda, President Bannon. his nationalist agenda, it, and and you know you hear it. I've never seen anything like it before in Washington in my life, Mike. You actually, he's actually worked reporters so much that they are asking the question: Well, what will Trump do if Bannon leaves? He won't have his nationalist agenda. We show the clips. Get the clips again. Nineteen from nineteen eighty-seven. We got the clips. Donald Trump being Donald Trump in nineteen eighty-seven when Steve Bannon was like, you know, was I don't Navy. know what Steve Bannon was doing in was 1987. In Did he not make the classic mistake, though, of thinking that he knew Trump better than anyone and better yes. than Trump knows himself? Because he has spent an inordinate amount of time, according to everyone you speak to over the past several months, and certainly since January 20th, indicating to outsiders that he made Trump president. Right. Yeah. That he yeah. molded his presidency, he, and now he can manipulate him he to do said what, it what, what, uh, at CPAC uh, what him that he and Kelly Ann got Trump elected, and he's telling everybody, if I leave, 
then there won't be the nationalist agenda that the New York Democrats will take over. Here's Donald Trump. Let's see. Circa. Third, 29 years. I'm not good with math. About 29 years before we met Steve Bannon, Donald Trump. Take a look. I see what's happening in this country where our so-called allies are just ripping us off left and right with Japan, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. They're just ripping this country off. And I could tell you if I ever was in office, which is unlikely because I don't think I want to be, but if I ever was, that would not happen. We, we wouldn't be taken advantage of the way we are. This country uh, is a great country, but we're a debtor nation. We borrow money from Japan in order to defend Japan, and we pay interest on that money, and I think it's just ridiculous. The country, the United States, is being ripped off, and it shouldn't happen. I mean, it, it really, it would be the equivalent of me taking credit for your writing at the New I'm not joking, yeah. for your writing at the New York Times in 1981, the Ratner style. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> no, Donald Trump's been saying this for 30 years, and Steve Bannon is trying to sell He's it. He's a glove on. And for some reason, reporters in Washington have bought it. Yeah. Right, right, but one yeah. of the first lessons, whether he said it to go or not, one of the first lessons you learn when you work in the White House, which I learned, is that I don't think anything. I didn't. I don't do anything. The president thinks everything. The president does everything. And to, to, to undercut the president or suggest that somehow you are his brain or his, his idea factory is crazy. And the second thing that certainly never happened in the Obama administration is whatever you might or may not have thought about Valerie Jarrett, nobody like took her on directly or tried to elbow her out of the way. That was, would have been a failing strategy. And right. so you just have to recognize this was, would there be, are... This would be the equivalent. I'm so glad you brought this up. This would be the equivalent of attacking Valerie Jarrett and Michelle Obama. Now, what aid would survive attacking Valerie Jarrett and Michelle Obama? None. Well, well, let me, let, last, I'll ask the table, I'll ask whoever is in Washington, Jeremy, Sam. Karl Rove had a lot written about him, you, you know, Bush's brain and all of that stuff. I never heard Karl Rove go, going around bragging never. That, that, that he was the guy behind Bush, that he was the guy who did this and Bush really didn't do it, that he was responsible. Never heard that. And I, w and I will say this too, uh, Sam, the, the, the Bushes, and I don't mean this to me in a demeaning way to Karl Rove, it's just a history, the Bushes kept Karl Rove in his place. Karl yeah. Rove never mistook himself for being president of the United States. <coughs> he knew he was a staffer. Uh, that's a great Michael Deaver quote. I he said, I loved Ronald Reagan. Well, I, he, I never once forgot that I was a staffer for Ronald Reagan. Steve Bannon has never seen himself <coughs> as a staffer. Or Kellyanne. Or Kellyanne. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is totally true. It's not just reporters, reporters who respond. You, play, you showed a tweet yesterday from Congressman Steve King where he basically called Steve Bannon the linchpin for Donald Trump's support structure among conservatives, which is absurd because obviously Trump made it through the primary just fine without Steve Bannon running the campaign. Um, I think part of the blame, though, does rest uh, outside of Steve Bannon. Uh, uh, a more forceful chief of staff, for instance, uh, would be someone who would push back against this narrative or at least clamp it down. If Trump had hired maybe more people accustomed to Washington and how yeah. Washington worked, you wouldn't have an outsized personality taking all the credit for an agenda that really, rightfully notes, hasn't really gone very far anyway. Uh, so I think Steve Bannon has actually filled a vacuum here. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's very abnormal for a staffer to publicly claim credit like he's doing for leading a vision, usually you're diminutive. You're serving the president. Uh, and in this case, Bannon has basically assumed the leadership mantle, at least from a philosophical standpoint, and I and now we're seeing the backlash to it. We're seeing Trump say, I don't want this. Uh, obviously, Trump's son-in-law saying this is bad for the president. But I don't uh, see a detente. I see, I, see, yeah, I can't have yeah. him around. Well, yeah, yeah, well, he's, we'll find yeah, out, listen, right? Listen, Ryan is there. And Reince is not going anywhere. Too disruptive. And, and if uh, if Bannon stays there, Jeremy Peters, uh, he will he will stay there uh, as a shadow of his former self. And I think some of the blame, as Sam was saying, that you know, there's a lot to spread around here for the organizational chaos and dysfunction inside this administration. But you know, the, so, the tone is set at the top, and this is what we've seen time and time again from Trump, you know, throughout the course of his campaign, and, and now it's infecting his White House. Absolutely, we'll say, Joe, you mentioned the, the Reagan parallels here. Uh, something somebody pointed out to me yesterday is that this this sounds like Ed Meese to them. Mm -hmm. it, it's you have the person in the White House, these Republican White Houses, who's always the carrier of the 
flame, you know, the, the voice uh, to the con the conduit to the grassroots. And right. that person's job is always to say, okay, grassroots, let's cool it. We need to know when to fight these battles. We need to know when to stand down. And, and, and Bannon needs to learn that role if he's going to the survive. The problem with Steve Bannon, Bannon versus Ed Meese is Meese had a background in the business before he got to Washington. And That's Ed right. Meese would never in a million years suggest that he was the brains behind Ronald Reagan. Not in a billion years would he do that. Steve Bannon was running a website yeah. in July. Lock and back. has been running around promoting himself, suggesting that he is Donald Trump's, uh, like, the, the genius that put nationalism in Donald Trump's brain. We can show the clip all day. It's just nonsense. Think again. We talked about it at the time, how crazy it is that 10, 11, 12 days yeah. after President Trump was sworn into office, Steve Bannon was on the cover of Time Magazine. Oh, my no, God. President yeah. Trump. Look, it, it's, uh, look, the closest people to Donald Trump are going to end up outside. Think about it. Flynn, Kellyanne, Steve Bannon, they're great for a dirty, sloppy, base drink driven slog to the finish to get this presidency. They are not good for a well-run, elegant White House. But and that will be the end of the story. But Donald Trump elected Donald Trump. Yeah. Corey didn't elect him. They were him. good tools. Manafort didn't elect him. Total tools. Uh, uh, um, you, you just uh, you got to yep. get the third. Uh, yeah. Bannon didn't elect him. Stop <laughs> insulting everybody. No, I'm just uh, explaining there were tools uh, that they could use. Oh, tool, tools to be used. Okay, that kind of tool. Okay. Like a hammer. Uh, but at the end of the day, like you said, I know we got to go. I'm so sorry, but like you said, Steve Bannon didn't cause the 6,000 or the 5,000 people to fight through a foot or two of snow, snow no. to get to New Hampshire in early February right. to see Donald Trump. It's no. a, whether you're in New Hampshire or whether you're at the Mississippi Gulf Coast Coliseum that Jane talked about, it's all about Trump. He doesn't need Steve Bannon. Nobody knows. He Nobody never, need knew, he had never needed Steve didn't Bannon. Didn't need Flynn. All right, Jeremy Peters. Jeremy Peters, thank you very much. Still ahead on Morning Joe between Rex Tillerson and Nikki Haley.